Hey, this is Mr. Aiden. This is AP Chemistry, the 2017 AP Chemistry exam. Free response problem number two. We're going through the 2017 exam question by question. So let's get to the 2017 exam. The first question on the exam is asking about formal charges. Now, formal charges might be one of those con concepts, content areas that you're like, I kind of totally forget what it's talking about. Well, it's trying to find out which which diagram is the best on the case of formal charges, which means I'm going to take a look at the valence number of electrons, the valence number of electrons, which means hydrogen's got one, carbon's got four, nitrogen's got five, oxygen's got six, it's the same on the other side, one, four, five, six, and what we're also then going to look at is how many electrons are immediately, how many electrons are immediately surrounding that atom. You can see hydrogen only has one electron immediately surrounding that atom. This carbon's got one, two, three, four immediately surrounding. The nitrogen's got one, two, three, four. And this oxygen's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, which means the hydrogen has a zero charge on it, the carbon's got a zero charge on it, the nitrogen is holding a positive one charge on it, whereas the oxygen's holding a negative one charge. Let's take a look at the other uh, molecule, the other diagram. We got one electron, carbon's got one, two, three, four, five, which means carbon is holding a positive one charge. This nitrogen is one, two, three, four and the oxygen is holding six around it, as you can see, which means zero charge, positive one charge, uh, sorry, negative one charge. There's one more electron in the carbon than there should be. Negative one charge, positive one charge on the nitrogen, and zero. And the we want formal charges that are going to normally equal zero overall. But if there's a negative, I want the, elect the negative on the most electronegative element, which means something like fluorine or oxygen or nitrogen. You can see that this diagram number one is having the negative charge on the um, on the oxygen, whereas the positive one charge is on the nitrogen, the mo most electronegative. Carbon, <laughs> carbon never, never has that negative or positive formal charge on it. Carbon's always going to have four bonds around it. Uh, which means carbon's always going to be a formal charge of zero. So we can say that this diagram right here is your best diagram because of the oxygen is holding the negative charge. We get one point for giving the formal charges of the two molecules and one point for saying that this molecule is the best because of the electronegative element of oxygen holding the negative charge. That was A worth two points. Then they get us to B. B is asking, it's a thermo problem. They have bonds, which means we need to do bond energy, which means on this side we're breaking bonds, and on this side we're forming bonds. And what do we know about breaking bonds? It's positive energy, it's endothermic. We need to put in energy to break bonds. Forming bonds is negative, it's exothermic, we're releasing energy, it's coming down in energy. And so what do we have to do? We have to do all my bond energy breaking and forming. You can see I'm breaking one carbon-hydrogen bond, that's 413. I'm breaking one triple bond, that's 891. And one single bond of nitrogen oxygen, that's 201. If I add those up, let me get quick get a calculator. We got 413 plus 891 plus 201. That gives us positive 1505 kilojoules per mole to break all those bonds. Now we're going to form some bonds. We need to form an NH bond, which is 391. We're going to form an N to C double bond. N to C double bond is 615. We're going to form a carbon oxygen sink, a double bond, which is 745. And so I'm going to take 391 plus 615 plus 745, and I'm going to get negative 1751 kilojoules per mole. You can see the break, the forming bonds is greater than the breaking bonds, which means that is going to win out. And so you have negative 1751 
plus 1505, which gives you negative a delta H of negative 246 kilojoules per mole, which means the negative means it's exothermic overall, and that means the bond energy of the forming bonds is greater than the bond energy of the breaking bonds. The products are favored in this case in terms of the bond energies. That was, let's give a little scoring guideline, uh, one point uh, for getting the negatives and the positives, okay, making sure that it's negative, and one point for your answer there. So one point for getting your bond energies on either side, and one point for your final answer. Then we go to a delta S problem. Delta S is entropy, or arrangement of particles, okay? And so we always want to think of delta S of disorder. Delta S of disorder, positive means more disorder. And so they say that the, it's close to zero. So if the delta S is close to zero, remember anytime we're looking at disorder, we're looking at number one, the states of matter, and number two, the number of moles, okay? And so that is going to go, come into the number of, that's going to result in number of arrangements of the particles or the disorder of the particles, the um, how the particles are, are, whether they're ordered or very, very disordered in terms of the number of arrangements. You can see the states of matter, the states of matter here, we have a gas forming a gas. The states of matter have not changed. We have one mole giving you one mole. The number of moles has not changed, which means the disorder, there will be, not be a number of increased number of arrangements, an increased number of arrangements. So no increase in the number of arrangements. And that was worth one point for talking about states of matter and number of moles and no increase in the number of arrangements. So that was C. Then we go D, it says which species is present at a higher concentration of, uh, at equilibrium, okay? And it says justify your answer in terms of thermodynamic favorability and the equilibrium constant. And so anytime they're talking about whether it's fair or not, go to your delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. We know our delta S is very close to zero. We know our delta H is negative, which would give result in a negative delta G, which means it is favorable. If we have a negative delta G, that means the K is gonna be greater than one. That is a favorable reaction, which means my products will be favored. Um, it will shift to the right. And so, which means the products the isocyanic acid will be higher in concentration, higher in the concentration, and so for that. And so that's worth two points. Uh, no, one point for relating your delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Uh, one point for your uh, showing that the isocyanic acid is higher in concentration because the K is greater than one, showing that K, you have to give the thermodynamic favorability and the equilibrium constant favorability as well. So that was D, two points. Let's go on to E. E is talking about a kinetics problem. You can see this is a first order reaction, first order reaction. And so how does this data tell whether it's a first order reaction? There's two ways to answer this problem. Number one, what, number one way, number one way, is showing that the half life is consistent. The half life is uh, is is constant. How do I know the half life is constant? What do I know about a first order half life reaction? The half life is equal to 0.693 over k, which means the half life is going to be consistent. You can see. Uh, when we go from 0.1 to 0.5, it took 10 hours. 0.5 to 0.25, it took 10 more hours. 0.025 to 0.0125, 10 hours. You can see the half-life the half -life time is 10 hours. You can see that in the graph as well. It got cut in half in 10 hours. It got cut in half in 10 hours. It got cut in half in 10 hours. Now, I know some of my students 
have said that if you took this data and you graphed the natural log of the concentration versus time, you would end up getting a linear graph. That is correct as well. You can answer it either way using your kinetics uh, th uh, thinking there. And so that's one point, one point for a correct explanation. Either the half-life is constant at 10 hours, or if you graph out the natural log of the concentration versus time, you get a linear graph. So that was worth one point. And then what do you know? They asked for K. And so what do we do for K? We know the half-life, the time half-life is 0.693 over K, which means K equals the natural log of two or 0.693 over the half-life. And so we have 0.693 over 10 hours, which ends up becoming 0 0.0693 hours to the negative one. And that was worth one point with the units. You need units there. One point time to the negative one or hours to the negative one for the units. Okay. Now the ending part of this problem, the ending part of this problem is problem F. And it says the student learns that the decomposition reaction was run in a solution of pH of 13. And they say briefly describe an experiment including the initial conditions that you would change in the data you would gather to determine whether the reaction rate depends on that hydroxide. So go back to your kinetics experiments. We want to keep the concentration of the CO and H22. We want to keep that concentration the same. Okay, and we want to put it in a hydroxide concentration of maybe, say, 0.1 molar. And then we want to time the reaction, time the reaction. Then we want to change the concentration of OH minus, keeping the same CO and H22, and we want to go to 0.2 molar, and we want to time our reaction. Then we want to change maybe to 0.3. We want to get a good amount of data here and we want to time our reaction. Therefore, we want to keep everything the same, but we want to change that time. And so we want to hold the temperature constant, hold the temperature constant, of course. And therefore, we can figure out whether it matters for zero, first, or second order on hydroxide. That was worth one point. 10 point problem. You can see A was worth two points, B was worth two points, that's four points now. C was worth one point, that's five. Six, seven is D. Eight, nine for E1 and E2. And the tenth point is F. And that's the 2017 AP Chemistry exam, problem number two. See you tomorrow for problem number three. See you guys, bye.